Welcome to worship this morning. To those who are worshiping virtually and to those who are in person, welcome to St. John's United Church of Christ. This is a communion Sunday, and so if you are worshiping with us virtually, you might want to have your bread and juice or wine, whatever you have, uh, ready for that part of the service. If you are here in person, I hope you have, along with your bulletin, uh, picked up a little chalice um, with the wafer and the juice in it, because that's what we will use uh, here in the sanctuary. Ours is an open table where everyone is welcome. Christ does the inviting to Christ's table. And those whom Jesus Christ has invited, we will not turn away. Today is annual meeting. And um, just like when I, we had Budget Cafe, you're, remember you're supposed to cheer. Today is annual meeting. <laughs> Yay! So welcome. That will be following worship. Um, it will be here in the sanctuary, but... So is it that everybody leaves and then that you sign it? Okay, because I missed it last year. Uh, I didn't know the routine. So we'll still go on out at the end of worship and then the members will sign in um, as they come back in so that we know whether or not we have a quorum uh, to have this meeting. Now there is some new music, or at least it's new to some of us, um, that will come. Um, I know it's in here somewhere. It's in your bulletin. Um, and it's called Blessed Are They. It goes along with the scripture of the Beatitudes. And the choir is going to be singing part. And the congregation is invited to join into the refrain. So it's on the second page of your, um, of your bulletin. It comes right after that scripture reading. So Ruth, I don't know this music, so you're going to lead us through it. Okay, so we will be ready to join in during worship by practicing now. Let's try it. So you can join in joyfully. <laughs> <laughs> 
when we get to that part of the service. It is important, I think, to know who is here and to greet one another. If you meet out on the sidewalk or as you come in, you may say good morning, but this is a different kind of greeting. It is the greeting that says, I am a part of the body of Christ this morning, and so are you. Because when we come together, we are the body of Christ in this place. So will you greet one another and pass the peace of Christ? May the peace of Christ be with you all.
one we delight to draw near to you, gracious God. We rejoice in the blessings you have given us. We lift up our hearts and voices in praise. We humble ourselves before God of all worlds. We gather to remember God's commandments. We seek for ourselves the wisdom God imparts. The wisdom of God is not like any other. It draws us away from the world's agenda. God sends us into the world with new priorities. We are grounded in the spirit that we might be discerning. We are filled with the mind of Christ. We are already citizens of God's realm. Let the mountains hear our voice raise and pray and praise. Wise and holy God, we gather in this sacred hour to honor and adore you. We come humbly claiming the cross of Jesus Christ as our sign. We give the thanks that you lift up the weak and lowly, defy the world's foolishness, and invite us to share in life at its fullest and best as disciples of Jesus. Amen. children, young people who would like to, to come up front. coming up. You're a quiet group this morning, huh? Can you, can you say good morning? good morning? Oh, very good. Very good. Nice to have you. I have a gift box here. It was a very special gift given to me just this morning. Alexander helped with this gift. So I had the box, but uh, when I opened it, what did you say into the box? You, you say, I love you? Did you? Yeah, he did. So this is now a box of love. So when I open it up, what do you see in there? You see nothing, but I know it's there. The love, you put the love in the box, and I know it's there. See, I can reach in and take out a part of it and feel that love and know this was a great gift. He's exactly right. I can put it back in. When I'm at home, I can take it out again and feel that love again. 
But there's another thing that's really special about love. I can share it. So I'm going to take some out and give it to you. Hold out your hand. There, I've given you some love. You know, oh, there's still plenty left. I can give you some. I can give you some. There's still plenty left. It, there's no, it's not going down at all. Look, here's some for you. And here's some for you, Tyler. And there's some for Scott. There's still plenty left. Isn't that neat the way love works that way? Yeah. It works that way at home. Your mom can love one of you, and there's still plenty left for your brother or your sister. It definitely works that way with God's love. I can give some to Don. I can give some to Ellen. Look, there's still plenty left. There's God's love, there's always plenty left. So I can close it up. God's love is still in there, and I can put it next to my heart and know that God loves me. And I will also know that Alexander put love in there for me, so that makes this a really special box for me. So whenever you are feeling like maybe you're alone, you can remember that, no, nope, I shared some love with you, and God's love is then always, always with you. All right, I'll say a little prayer, and then you can go back to the adults you were with, or you can go to Sunday school. All right? Well, you've, you've, when you go to downstairs for classes, Dad can tell you all about it, okay? Okay, you, you, yeah, you talk to Papa about it, all right? Okay, God, thank you for loving us. Thank you for filling the box. Thank you for filling our hearts with love. Amen. All right, thank you. You can go back to Papa and ask him about going to Sunday school, okay? Lord says, rise, plead your case before the mountains, and let the hills hear your voice. Hear you mountains, the controversy of the Lord, and you enduring foundations of the earth. For the Lord has controversy with his people, and he will contend with Israel. O oh, my people, what have I done to you, and what have I weared you? Answer me. And I brought you up from the land of Egypt and redeemed you from the house of slavery. And I sent before you Moses, Aaron, and Miriam. O oh, my people, remember now what King Balak and uh, Muhammad devised that Balaam's son of Barah answered him. And what happened from shifting to, to Gilead and that you may know the saving acts of the Lord. With what shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before God on high? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves and a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams and tens of thousands of rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul. He has told you, O, my, o mortal, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you but to do justice and to love kindness and to walk humbly with, with your God? Matthew 5, 1 through 12. When Jesus saw the crowds, he went up the mountains, and after he sat down, his disciples came to him. When he began to speak, and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. 
Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness sake, for, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your rewards is great in heaven, for in the same way they prosecute the prophets who were before you. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God.
Today's reading from the Gospel of Matthew, which was echoed in the song that we and the choir just sang, it's called the Beatitudes. Most of us are familiar with it, perhaps memorized it in confirmation class or some other time. Most of the time we think of it as a beautiful writing, and it is. It's like a poem that we love to hear again and again. But when I began to look more deeply at it, I found several problems with coming to an understanding of what it really says. Jesus was not reciting poetry. Jesus wanted his audience to find meaning, help for their lives, connection to God. Nadia Bowles Weber suggests that in order to understand the Beatitudes, we need to remember who may have been in Jesus' audience that day. And here is her suggestion. If you go back to chapter four of the gospel, because the, the Beatitudes come at the beginning of chapter five, you see that Jesus had become famous as someone who could heal the people of their diseases. So people followed him wherever he went. Then that crowd of people with various illnesses, including those possessed by demons, those with epilepsy, those who were paralyzed, they gathered then on the hillside to hear him preach. This is not a people who would be able to keep everything clean and sanitary. This is not people who could afford doctors, even if they could help. And when we remember all of that, we see that this is not the crowd to hear poetry or to hear a list of things that they might try to live up to so that they could be blessed. The ones who followed Jesus out to that hillside were people that Jesus loved and they already were blessed just as they were and he wanted them to know that. Weber describes them as the sick, those who were in pain, those who fought with demons, those who were broken and addicted and late on their back taxes, who had more than one ex-wife and watched too much Netflix and think that maybe a little heroin might help. In other words, they were people standing in the need of God. And standing in the need of God is standing in the way of blessedness in a way that having it all together never is. By the way, Nadia Bowles Weber is a great preacher and author. If you see pictures of her with all of her tattoos and everything, you might be a little taken aback, but she is very wise, and she will be the keynote speaker this summer at the UCC General Synod in Indianapolis. A great opportunity for us, because it's not that far away. But anyway, Jesus said to these people gathered there on the hillside, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. They were already poor in spirit, weighed down by their cares. And they were mourning, heartbroken by the state of their world and humble because perhaps they knew they would never get out of the financial rut that they were in. And Jesus told them they were blessed people. And so there is the next problem that I ran into. What does that word blessed mean? It's sometimes interpreted as happy, uh, but I'm not sure that quite fits. They followed Jesus into the countryside because they had problems. And I don't think that made them particularly happy. The Latin word for beatitude derives from the Hebrew word for blessed or blessed, which is esher. Esher can mean to be happy, but it also means to advance, to move forward, to make progress. That puts a different light on it. Blessed are the poor in spirit because they are able to go forward and they were going forward toward the kingdom of heaven or some translations say the kingdom of God. 
There was a certain elderly Methodist bishop who had in front of him a line of people who were candidates for ordination. And so he warned them that he was about to ask them the questions that were typical in the Methodist church for anyone aspiring for ordination. And first on the list was, are you going on to perfection? He faced a row of eyes who were avoiding him and hesitant responses, so he snapped, well, if you are not going on to perfection, where are you going? The bishop's question was a good one. Where are you going? Going to the kingdom of God, we hope. So there's the next problem with the Beatitudes. What, when, where is that? The kingdom of God. It's in the realm of the already, the here and now, and not yet. Jesus, I don't think, was talking about a heavenly place where their souls would be someday after they died. He was talking about the kingdom of God on earth, the best vision of a perfect world. Jesus is not describing life in the ordinary world in which sinful humanity sometimes seems to be in charge. But life in the emerging kingdom is where God is sovereign. This is the new world in which those who mourn are comforted and those who are meek will receive their inheritance and those who seek the kingdom of God will find their quest fulfilled. The kingdom of God is a reality that shatters the conventional limitations of space and time. Paul described it in his letter to the Corinthians, for now we see in a mirror dimly, but then we shall see face to face. Now I know only in part, then I will know fully. The kingdom of God is already here, but not fully. It has always been here, manifested in God's act of creation. It is the reality that we, like the disciples, experience in the presence of Jesus Christ as, un, as eternity is unfurled before us. The kingdom of God lies at the core of the Christian hope, the hope that the kingdom we now see partially and hesitantly will ultimately be fully realized. Matthew's Gospel presents the Beatitudes as an exposition of this hope. And because of that hope, the listeners could know that they were blessed. They could be satisfied. The next few of the Beatitudes also tell about the kingdom of God. In that vision where people live as God desires them to. People who hunger and thirst for righteousness will be filled. And anyone who shows mercy will also receive mercy. If your heart is pure, you will be able to see God. In the world of the here and now, peacemakers may be reviled. But in refusing to divide the world's people into binary categories of us and them, of friends and foes, they are proclaiming the kingdom's presence. The world may reject them now, but God claims peacemakers as God's own. And finally, Jesus did recognize that we are not yet living in that perfect kingdom. The prophets, those who bring God's message to the world, have always been persecuted. And Jesus knew that he and some of his listeners would also be persecuted and reviled as they shared his message. And yet, because the blessed are moving forward toward God's kingdom, these prophets of old and now can rejoice and be glad knowing they will be rewarded. Is it, worse, is, is it worth it risking everything in this world of worldly values for a kingdom that is not fully here as he shares this vision of the kingdom of God and its promises, Matthew, as he wrote this, his answer is unequivocally yes. It is worth it. 
The Greek world that we are translating as blessed here is makarios. And it partially describes the gods. So Jesus is encouraging his listeners to have a godlike joy, even in a life waiting for the fulfillment of the kingdom of God. So may that untouchable joy, which the world cannot take away, be yours, even as you mourn or feel poverty of spirit, even when you are persecuted for sharing that light of the epiphany. Amen. Will you stand if you are able as we sing, His Eye is on the Sparrow. We come now to a time of prayer. There are times when our hearts ache and our souls wander and we are full of doubts. Even then, or especially then, we turn to you in prayer, O oh God. We see the news flashed across the television of natural disasters and attacks on the innocent. We mourn these tragic losses and pray for those who have survived. We see bold headlines in the newspapers that grab our attention and make us feel ill. And we wonder where you are in all of this, oh God. Closer to home, we learn of illness in someone we love or ourselves, and we find ourselves struggling for breath and longing for reassurance. Relationships with loved ones falter. Money worries assault us. Our faith falters. And so we pray, O oh God, we listen for your assurance. Today we pray especially for Shirley, 
Arland, Betty, AJ, Paul, Terry. We pray for the people of Ukraine. We pray for Costa Rica, and with their people, we offer our special prayers for communities experiencing the impacts of climate change, whether in stronger hurricanes or ongoing drought. May our cries for climate justice be heard in those places where decisions are made. And may resources be made available to build communities able to adapt and thrive. For people around the world, for ourselves, O oh God, we come to you remembering that your love is always with us. We come knowing that you can handle our doubts and our misgivings, that you hear our prayers for those we love, and that you hear us as we thank you and give you praise for our blessings. We pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. The scripture from Micah told us that God is not pleased with burnt offerings, not impressed by the size of our gifts. God wants all of us, our full devotion, and our giving is a symbol of that. God calls us to lives of mercy and peacemaking, and our giving can help that to begin. And so through the many ways we have to give, we give in prayer, we give with thanksgiving. And I invite you to celebrate our giving now by standing and singing the doxology. devote ourselves and our gifts of thankfulness toward the realization of your reign among us, holy God. We pray for the purity of heart as we hunger and thirst for righteousness and as we seek to be peacemakers. We rejoice in this opportunity to share in the extension of your kingdom. Bless us and our use. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. We celebrate this holy meal because Jesus' ministry often happened around tables. Tables where the unwelcome were invited in, where the powerful were taught and humbled, where the hungry were fed and the thirsty were given something to drink. In these meals, God's saving presence was revealed and made real, and a new form of community was given birth. We come to this table to meet Jesus, made known in the breaking of the bread. God, we give thanks for your presence made known through your creation. We are thankful that it was your word born on your very breath which commanded the first waters to yield the disordered ardor of abundant life. We give thanks that you parted the seas, offering us a way out of bondage. We are glad that you have rocked in the waters of Mary's womb and that your feet have felt the welcome of warm soil cupped around them. We give thanks for our lives molded from the same warm soil of earth and your enlivening breath. 
We know your goodness in fields that hold seeds of grace and seeds of wheat in equal measure. We celebrate life with grains and fruits set on the table that all may be refreshed. And we are thankful that we are neither the first nor the last to be invited to this feast, but are members of a great web of worshipers who have come before and will come long after. We continue with the prayer of confession. The world's wisdom surrounds us. It says, look after number one. Better be safe than sorry. Only the strong survive. Makes the world around. Revenge is sweet. Avoid, Avoid pain, pain at all costs. costs. May God forgive us when we, as Christ's own people, <coughs> believe these words to be life-giving when Jesus has shown us a better way. Blessed are those who recognize the wisdom of God and strive to shape their lives around its truth. In Christ, God forgives us and restores us to the way of trust and mercy. Thanks be to God. Amen. We remember that on the night of betrayal and desertion, Jesus took bread, gave thanks to God for it, broke it, and gave it to his disciples saying, this is my body that is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And also there after supper, Jesus took the cup and when he had blessed it, he gave it to the disciples saying, this is the new covenant in my blood. As often as you drink this, do so in remembrance of me. By this bread, Christ's body is fed. We are gathered and sent into God's world to proclaim shalom. Through this cup of blessing, our old covenant with death is broken and we are filled with new life. Gracious God, we ask you to bless the bread and the cup and all of us with the outpouring of your Holy Spirit. Through this meal, make us the body of Christ, the church, your servant people, that we may bear your light for the furtherance of your will in all the world. Amen. And let us pray together now with the words that Jesus taught his first disciples. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. I invite you to take your little chalice Open up and take out the wafer, the bread. This is the bread of life. The bread given to all of us to remember Jesus every time we eat it. Take and eat. And you can turn and open the other side. This is the cup of the new covenant. This is the blood of Jesus poured out in love of us all. Take and drink. Will you stand if you are able as we join in a prayer of thanksgiving for everything we have received. 
We thank you, God, because you have invited us to this table. Here we are strengthened for the task ahead of us, the loving of the world. Here we receive all Christ's gifts. Strengthen our faith, help us love one another and your creation more. Teach us to pray, share, sing, teach, feed, heal, call, and welcome as you have done to us. Make our lives a form of praise for your love shown to us through Jesus Christ. Amen. be seated. What does God require of us today and every day? During our congregational meeting, wherever we may go during the coming week, to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with God. May God bless you and keep you. And the children have a gift of love for all of us. So we're going to, they're bringing them in, okay. Thank you. Yeah. Take one over to Miss Ruth at the organ.
Uh, with the choir. 